coming up this week on Sporting Journal Radio. It's it's a vehicle that it's looks like it's 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 really built for the overlanding community. But they walked out in front, just took a sample, and it was already three inches thick last week. I fish, I hunt, and always will. Broadcasting from the Prairie Sportsman Studios. Presented by OnX. Know where you stand with OnX. <clears throat> We're not just a radio show anymore. Heck yeah. This is Sporting Journal Radio. That's right. Welcome to the show. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in on this station here by downloading the podcast wherever you get your favorite podcasts or by watching this on YouTube. Thank you very much. That's Dan Amundsen right over there. Dan, how you doing? Yo. Dan is finally on the Instagram reel train. No, I wouldn't say that yet. I've just, it's kind of starting to work because I think because our phones are listening, they've heard me trash them so much. They're like, oh, I'll show you. Well, joke's on you, Instagram. That's what I wanted the whole time. You still suck. You, so you think you're finally getting some traction on reels just because they're listening to you? Yeah, because they are realizing I'm going to stop posting reels, which is not which is exactly the opposite of what they want, because right. I'm going to start putting them all on TikTok and other places. They're like, whoa, we can't lose them. They want to rule the world. And so they're like, oh, well, I guess we better give them a boost here and keep them on board. So well played. The difference for me is that I listened to them and started doing reels and we got a bunch of cool reels up on the Sporting Journal Radio Instagram page or uh, my page or Dan's page or we've been putting some up on the Prey Sportsman page and uh, Taz and Lake Lodge page, North American Waterfowl page. I've just been putting reels up everywhere. So if you're on Instagram, follow all of our pages. And if you go to mine, you'll see links to all of them uh, there on Instagram. Yeah, there you go, at Brett.Amundsen. If you're listening on the radio, at Brett.Amundsen. Uh, you can find Brett with one T, by the way. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, you just saw it on the screen right there. Our listeners probably don't know how to read, though, so it's a good thing you read it. <laughs> hey, our listeners are They're very awesome. smart. Uh, you know how to read better I than I I can't believe do. you just said that about them. I can't even switch to wow. turn my camera on. I, I think maybe you're the one that's I was, struggling. I was trying to make a dig at us more than anything. And then I, realized, <laughs> I know you were. It just then I realized <laughs> it made a big dig on our listeners, <laughs> and very good. nobody's listening anymore. So uh, That's funny. Whoops. All right. Well, you should listen because we got a good show for you this week uh, a lot about conservation this week which is important to us that's very important to us here on this show is we're we're big into conservation and conservation work and taking care of uh, habitat out there for our wildlife cleaning up after ourselves whether it's a, a leave no trace or keep it clean as you'll hear more about as uh, as ice starts to build and ice fishermen ice anglers start to take to the lakes uh, make a plan clean up after yourself. Joe Henry's going to tell us more about that and uh, talk about the ice fishing show coming up in St. Paul and uh, give us a little report from what's going on up at Lake of the Woods right now. And then Kurt McAllister is going to join us. He is the uh, national manager of outdoor communication for Toyota. Toyota has got a concept vehicle, concept truck, a concept grade of a, of a Toyota Tundra or, or Tacoma. It's a new version that outdoor enthusiasts will really be interested in. We're going to find out what that's all about, what it comes with, when it's going to come out, when you can see it and get your hands uh, behind the wheel uh, on this vehicle right here. Kurt will tell us more about that and talk about how how Toyota is made it a point to be involved in things like uh, pollinator habitat, and uh, collegiate fishing teams and just being involved, actively involved in promoting the outdoors uh, through environmental stewardship or uh, giving out youth scholarships and things like that. So Kurt will join us in a little bit to talk about more. Uh, Dan, who are our sponsors this week? Yeah, this week we have Onyx Hunt. Know where you stand with Onyx. Lake of the Woods Tourism. Lake of the Woods is the walleye capital. Plan a trip for this winter at Lake of the Woods, MN.com. Live Target. Match the hatch at LiveTargetLures.com. Welcome aboard, Live Target. Haybell Heights Campground and Resort. Book a trip to Devil's Lake. Learn more at HaybellHeights.com. Al Claire Audio. Save your hearing in the field with Al Claire. Learn more at AlClaire.com. Ottertail Lakes Country. Find your inner otter at OttertailLakesCountry.com. And Prairie Sportsman, the new season starts in January. Watch episodes, though, anytime at the Prairie Sportsman YouTube channel. 
Yeah, or prairiesportsman.org. All right, uh, a lot to get to. It's been a busy week. You know, I, I don't want to say the hunting seasons are starting to wind down because they're not. Obviously, there's a lot of bow hunting left. There's a muzzleloader season yet. Uh, guys up north, they're still chasing deer around. Uh, upland seasons are going strong. People are going to start planning trips to go to warmer climates to chase uh, birds and animals around a little bit. But our waterfowl season is probably, for us here in uh, the central, uh, we're near the southern zone in Minnesota, for us, our waterfowl season is starting to wind down, despite the fact that it's probably the best it's been uh, all year. Aside from some, pretty, we had some pretty good teal shoots and yep. a couple of good diver shoots, but really the big mass uh, migration of geese and mallards is finally coming through our part of the state. And what's happening, Dan? It's freezing up. And hey, are you going to get an email this week now saying you're real just negative Nancy? Because <laughs> I made the same comment last week and got an email. I don't remember who sent that in, but uh, right. I was just being realistic. That's all. And now, now Brett's being realistic. So I'm just saying our season's winding That's down. That's what I'm I was not, saying last I'm not week, happy too. About it. Well, you were, you were definitely it. ranting about a few things. Well, yeah, because it was frustrating that all the birds are showing up and it's freezing up. Yeah, I can't. That sucks. I want to find the email. I can't find it now. But uh, you can email us through sportingjournalradio.com if you have a comment or a suggestion or an idea or something to talk about us or here in the show. Dan's or takes. trash Dan's takes. Apparently. You were being kind of a negative Nancy last week. Yeah. If you sit in the woods and you see more orange than deer, you're going to get a little frustrated. <laughs> if you have the best push of waterfall all season and lakes freeze up and they're hard to hunt now, you're going to get a little frustrated. And yeah, I know it's hunting, it's fishing. We should just enjoy being out there. And I do. That's right. But when you're trying to do it all the time, and, and I know this, I'm sounding like just a spoiled little brat here because we get to hunt and fish more than most. I get that. So when you're listening at work or wherever, I appreciate you listening. I'm sorry that you have to listen to me get frustrated with it. But given our current situation for hunters and anglers, it can be very frustrating when things don't go right and you can't do anything about it. Yeah, for Rant sure. over this week. This week. I, for whatever reason, I feel like that's not the last time you'll be oh, ranting about I think stuff. Because be now you're just ranting segment. about people complaining about your ranting. Yeah, but you know what I like? It means people are listening. <laughs> that's right. So, yes. Whoever, thank you very I much. I can't find the email now, but whoever that was, thank you very much for listening, of course. And uh, Dan, he, I think he asked if you were a glass half full or a glass oh, yeah. half empty kind of guy. Well, high aspirations, low expectations. You'll never be disappointed a day in your life. Think about it. So is that half empty? Probably. Yeah, I think yep. so. Yeah, all right. Well, Because then you're jacked when it's half full. Check us out at sportingjournalradio.com. If you have a comment, you can contact us uh, there and send us an email. All right, uh, but it is fun right now. Like, we've got snow on the ground, so uh, geese like to play a little bit better, I think, when there's snow on the ground. The decoys really pop. Uh, pheasant tracks show up in the snow right now. And if you are deer hunting, deer, you know, are easier to track. If you hit a deer, it's a lot easier to track it. So a little bit of snow on the ground is great. And as I was telling you, Dan, I did shovel off the sidewalk today and the snow on the sidewalk is melting a little bit. But I think the majority of our snow, I don't know if we're going to lose it. I don't think so. It's here to stay, uh, which is fine. It's that time of year. I'm okay with that. As long as what, what I fear is going to happen is in December, like mid-December, it's just going to get real warm. And this is, this is half glass empty again. And everything is going to melt and we're going to have bad ice and, and no snow. And it's going to be a, a janky winter on the lakes, which that'd just be our luck. But so be it if that happens. I've had some bad ice before. I don't want to talk about them. Uh, we had some buddies uh, show up. Thomas Hope came down and spent a few days here at, at the house and uh, did some waterfowl hunting, did some pheasant hunting. And Thomas has a YouTube channel, Hoke Outdoors on YouTube. Check it out. He does a lot of waterfowl content, does a lot of waterfowl hunting out of a kayak. And he's he brought his kayak down and he shows up with his kayak. And I'm like, dude, you're like a week, a week late. Because pretty much just about everything you can kayak is frozen right now. Uh, but he did find some open water and he did some filming and I did some filming with him too. And you'll be able to see that coming up on our YouTube channel, Sporting Journal Radio, and also Thomas's uh, YouTube channel, Hoke Outdoors. Also, Forrest Houston and Andy Reeves came down. Now, those are the two guys that guide layout duck boat hunts, layout boat duck hunts on Lake of the Woods and Mille Lacs. And uh, they wanted to do some pheasant hunting, so I jumped out and uh, took, grabbed the camera and took Forrest, Andy, and Thomas on a on a pheasant hunt, and it was it was pretty wild. And we filmed that, and we'll be putting that out on the Sporting Journal Radio YouTube channel at some point. So make sure you subscribe it, like it, follow it, check out the videos that we do there, because not only do you get to see this podcast that uh, that we put out on that channel, but a lot of our hunting and fishing adventures too, vlog style uh, videos and films and things 
things like that. We got just a ton of different content on the Sporting Journal Radio YouTube channel. We do have another film planned. It's Kodiak. It's going to be a North American waterfowl film. We're just absolutely jacked about this. It's uh, sponsored by Boss, also Sitka and Beretta. And we have some other guys that are going to be helping us out. And we're going to be using some of their stuff in Alaska and shooting... uh, uh, Long tails and harlequins and mallards, maybe some mallards. Which it's pretty gonna be pretty sad. I've shot two mallards this year here in Minnesota. If I shoot more mallards in Alaska than I do in Minnesota, that's a pretty sad state of affairs on our waterfall season this year. I mean, it's just the way it's gonna be. But I think it'd be pretty cool. It'd be awesome. Shoot mallards in the mountains. In the mountains, yeah. Wicked uh, on Kodiak. And, you know, fatty those mallards are probably oh, gosh, be up I there. Can't wait. Oh boy, cannot wait. So we'll be doing the podcast from up there. You get to see all sorts of. Uh, footage from Kodiak Island right here on the show. We got a lot planned in the next couple months here on this podcast. Uh, We do have Thomas Oak coming up here in a couple of weeks. He'll be on the show. Uh, Art Diaz from Al Clare Outdoors is going to be joining us. Now, Al Clare, they're custom molded hearing protection. They've been doing in-ear monitors for musicians for a long time. They're a Minnesota-based company and now they're providing hearing protection, custom hearing protection for uh, people that hunt. And if you want to protect your ears, I've been saying this for years, if you want to protect your ears, your ears yeah exactly wear hearing protection whether it's whatever get something on your ears and if you want next level stuff something that fits in your ear it's comfortable it's going to block out all the loud noises over a certain decibel level and then amplify other noises so if you're in the duck blind and you want to hear your buddies talking call the shot it's going to pick up that noise but when those guns go off if you want to protect your hearing that's what these do Al Claire Outdoors, Al Claire Audio. Uh, check them out. So Art's going to be joining us to talk a little bit more about what they do uh, for hearing protection. And then Art's just a, he's a great waterfall photographer. If you don't follow him on YouTube and uh, in, or follow him on Instagram, uh, find Art Diaz there on uh, on Instagram. All right. Thanks for sticking around. we got a big show. We'll be right back. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Looking for winter adventure? Might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes. Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. Find your inner otter at ottertaillakescountry.com. All right, this is Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in on this station on the network by demand at sportingjournalradio.com. Maybe you downloaded the podcast. Thank you very much. Or you could be watching this on YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Uh, that's Dan Amundsen right over there. And we are a part of something called Aglow, the Association of Great Great Lakes Outdoor Riders. And through that organization, we've learned uh, a lot about different outdoor products. We've met a lot of great people in the outdoor industry. And one of them is our next guest, Kurt McAllister. He's the National Manager of Outdoor Communications with Toyota. Kurt, how you doing? Great, Brett. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And I'm, uh, you know, we, we're getting a lot of snow here in Minnesota. You're in Michigan, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. How's your weather in Michigan right now? We uh, we got about an inch yesterday, but it's slowly dissipating. But uh, it's making the hunters happy. I know oh. that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know deer hunters, even pheasant hunters, we pheasant hunted the other day, and it was nice to be able to look down and see pheasant tracks. So, okay, they, they were here. I knew there were some yep. pheasants in here. Yep, but absolutely. as I was driving my my old pickup through a field and, uh, you know, kind of getting stuck here and there, I was realizing I need, I need some new wheels. And you sent out a press release, and we put it through the outdoor feed, our new communications uh, arm of a glow. And it's about a new Toyota. It's about a new grade of Toyota pickups uh, that you were telling us about, the Trail Hunter. Tell us what this is all about. Sure. So just two weeks ago at the SEMA show, which is the big aftermarket show there in Las Vegas, we showed a concept vehicle called Trail Hunter. Um, and again, it's it's a vehicle that it looks like it's 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 really built for the overlanding community, and you know anyone who wants to go off pavement for prolonged periods of time, 
And so, you know, we showed everyone the concept and we said, oh, by the way, this is coming to market under the new grade Trail Hunter. So uh, it's going to be built for our trucks predominantly at this point in time. And the beautiful thing about this is we're kind of cutting out the aftermarket or at least the need for the aftermarket. We actually are going to work with our engineers to actually build these in the factories. So when they hit the dealership or when they roll into the, the driveways of our, of our owners, they're ready to roll. So, um, you know, this kind of complements our, our great history of off-roading for both Tacoma and Tundra. Uh, you know, both vehicles, of course, have been proven on the sands of Baja. We've got, you know, TRD Pro, which is essentially a high-speed off-roading variant. And then, of course, most of our trucks who actually are, are purchased, about half of them, uh, are come with TRD accessories. So we know that people like to take these things off pavement. Now this is speaking really to the overlanding community and the greater outdoor community at large. I'll tell you, I am. Uh, I've been more and more impressed with the Toyota trucks. You know, I've had I've had Toyota vehicles. I've had uh, a couple of Camrys. I've got a Highlander right now. I do have a Silverado. I'm just full disclosure, but I've Fine. but I've owned it for 13 years. You know, like I, I've just had it for a long time, and uh, and I just I honestly I don't drive it more than about 20 miles away. <laughs> you know, I drive, I drive, if I got to go further, I jump in the Toyota, but, um, you know, and we kind of where we live, it's a lot of, it's a lot of it, historically kind of a lot of GM type pickups out there, but I'll tell you, I've noticed it even in this, this country where I'm at, this area that I'm at, not this country, but this area that I'm at, I've seen more and more Tundras driving around and Tacomas. Actually, there's a Tacoma guy stayed here for the last, uh, last few days at the house and he was driving a Tacoma and you know, I've been more and more impressed with those Toyota trucks, Kurt. Yeah, I mean, they they they're they're known for their longevity. I mean, our our kind of our pillars are quality, reliability, and dependability. And um, there's a statistic that kind of blows people away that 80% of all the vehicle that is vehicles that have been purchased in the last 20 years are still on the road, and a good chunk of those are our trucks. Um, you know, you talk about high mileage. We located in the last two years two tundras, in the, both in the state of Louisiana, who had rolled a million miles. Wow! So what <laughs> wow. we did is, and they both were like national sales managers. So what we did is we actually had, um, we actually bought those vehicles back and in return gave them new tundras, and we kind of de-engineered and de decontented these things to see what we did right, and our suppliers came in to see what they had done right in terms of their parts. And accessories. So, yeah, if you own a Toyota, you can expect to go at least a half a million miles if you take care of it the right way. Yeah, I think one of the Camrys. I think I had over three hundred thousand on it before I yeah. before I I ended up getting a different Camry. But um, so it just just broken in. That's yes. what we see Toyota. Just <laughs> That's right. In. You know, and the Tundra. You just came out with a new Tundra last year, correct? R right, we did. Yeah, so it's uh, been on market for about six months, and it's doing great. It's uh, Our sales are up about 15%. Even in this reduced supply chain era we're living in with, you know, the inventories aren't great. But um, uh, the thing that's kind of marvelous about not only um, is it a great truck, we actually dropped the V8 for now a twin-turbo V6. Hmm. And in doing so, we actually gained horsepower. We are now at 387 horsepower. And our towing capability is now 12,000 pounds. Oh, wow. Throw on top of that, we now have a hybridized version, which you're throwing another motor on top of that. With that, now the horsepower, the capability is 437 horsepower <laughs> with the same towing capability. You know, when people think about hybrids, they think about things like Priuses and, and, and little vehicles, little econo boxes. Right. Now, with, with hybrid technology, you, you pull another motor in there. Now it's become kind of a, a performance message. And so with our, with our uh, Tundra, we're now seeing that nearly between 20 and 25% of all new Tundra sales are the hybrid, hmm. that iForce Max hybrid engine. So uh, people, are, people are understanding that uh, green can be power at the same time. Yeah, I mean, that's number one, I think. Everybody wants mileage, uh, but everybody wants to keep their power, especially if you're going to drive a pickup. You want to have the best mileage that you can, but you still got to be able to tow stuff. Right. Yeah, and uh, you know the one thing I mentioned, the the, the the MPG on that truck, I mean, 24 miles per gallon, which is unheard of for a truck. But yeah, yeah, you still want to have the capability of towing that boat, towing that horse tra horse trailer, or those those snowmobiles. So, 
at 12,000 pounds, we can pretty much uh, take care of everyone's needs. So let's go back to the, the trail hunter. So this new Tundra could have a trail hunter version of the Tundra next year. And basically for, for people that are gonna camp, they're gonna go off the grid a little bit. They're gonna get out and spend some time in the outdoors. You're basically setting these up so that they don't have to add on to their Tundra. It's gonna come ready to go out the door. Ready to go. And if you look at the concept, um, we're talking about things like enhanced suspension, skid plates and rock rails, roof racks, steel bumpers, lighting in the grill, fog lamps. You saw the portable refrigerator yeah. and of course, rooftop tents. So everything you want to do to go off the grid and stay off the grid for a prolonged period of time. When, when do you think we would see this? Well, we're saying sometime next year, we'll make the announcement. Um, you know, if you don't notice right there, the logo is that kind of cool. The, the trail hunter logo is actually, um, it resembles a compass. So again, all oh, part of the sure. message about, you know, when you're off, when you're, when you're off road, Hey, just go, just point it North or South, wherever you want to go. And, and, and this vehicle is more than capable of getting you there. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll hear something more about trail hunter in the first half of next year, but it's definitely coming. So would there be, a, would there be hybrid versions of that then too? Well, we'll have to see. Um, we'll have to see what, what variants of Tundra and Tacoma uh, it's offered on. I mean, right now, Tacoma is just purely gas, but sure. uh, we'll have to see what uh, what, it's, what kind of offerings there are for, for the Tundra. Tundra's really taken an interest in the outdoors, haven't they? Oh, yeah. It's, I mean, probably going back 30, 40 years, even, you know, going, you know, we've been involved. Of course, everyone th talks about Bassmasters. Um, we have been involved with... Um, you know, getting involved with a lot of conservations with the National Education Environmental Foundation. You know, we are, for the last 25 years, we've been a key sponsor of National Public Lands Days. So we believe if you, if you, if you, if you talk the talk, you got to walk the walk, especially when it comes to being the environment or being green. So, you know, one of the things that's kind of a, a, a neat project that we started back in the spring was um, a group, a, a, a partnership we did with the the Sioux tribe in South Dakota and we're going to help um, replenish the bison uh, population up there uh, probably within the next five years hopefully grow that herd to about 1200 1200 um, buffalo really and again it's going to be managed by the Sioux tribe in fact it'll be the largest Native American managed um, uh, herd in North America with the idea that the tribe gets to use it and utilize it for food or sell it off but again, we are gonna, we're, we're uh, a sponsor of that. We're helping build the fencing and, and helping um, uh, provide funding for some of the facilities. Because, you know, again, bison are important to the, not only to the land, but also to the indigenous people of South Dakota. Everything uh, that you hear about conservation these days, also I've, I feel like pollinators get tied into it. And right. you guys are, are, you guys have a seventh environmental action plan yeah, yeah, we've, we've got a big action plan. Um, you know, with the, the pollinator program, uh, again, it's something we announced right around spring of last year. Again, it's looking at, uh, it's gonna be a five-year program. We're, again, we're doing this with the National Environmental Education Foundation, along with the Pollinator Partnership to help um, increase and improve some of the, the, the lands that those, ha those, those pollinators, again, those bats, those butterflies, uh, the little critters that are important for pollination, uh, we're talking about 26,000 acres over 13 states, uh, primarily, uh, you know, greenlands and, 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 and meadows. Uh, because again, <laughs> you know, 80% of all, all flowering plants around the world, uh, uh, they need the help of pollinators. If pollinators ever go away, we're, we're kind of hosed as, as a species ourselves because we need those creatures to, of course, uh, keep the, the food chain and, and keep the cycle of life going. Absolutely. You know, and, and habitat is one of our, um, kind of one of our mantras here on this show is just uh, creating and preserving habitat as much as possible. And pollinators such, play such a big role in that. And it's nice to see a company, I mean, obviously they're, they're great vehicles, but it's nice to see a company take a, an active interest in something like that. And, and you know, you'll hear about companies take interest in the we're about the environment but to but to go out there and especially do it you know in the sportsman side of things that's what i like to sure. see of course because that's my world but to, to actually yeah put your money where your mouth is that's a big deal 
Yeah, we actually have an environmental, environmental sustainability department within Toyota that has nothing to do with our products. All they do is they seek out partnerships and ways to make the, the, the earth a better place and a more sustainable place. So uh, it's headed by a gentleman by the name of Kevin Butt, and he's the one that actually brokered the deals with both the Pollinator Program and the Sioux Tribe. So uh, Kevin gets a lot of um, credit for, for forging these relationships, again, for the betterment of society and the betterment of the environment. We're in. Uh, did you guys have all this information on the website somewhere where people? Oh yeah, Dan's got it right there. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We our our website is. Uh, if you want to go to our website, ToyotaNewsroom dot com, um, it's a media site, but it's actually a public domain site. So if you go in there, there's lots of different tabs you can pull down to find out more about our products, about the environment, about our our, our factories, about our philanthropic giving. Um, we open that up to everyone to to view and read. So. Uh, again, toyotanewsroom.com is a, it's a great resource for everything Toyota here in the United States. I'm looking in the background there uh, where you're sitting, uh, and I see an award on the wall. Is that from a Glow? Is that one of the Glow yeah. Awards? Yeah, that uh, that was that was the, one of the Glow Awards. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that was a Glow Award from about four years ago. So um, yeah, I, I've uh, been involved with the Glow for about uh, ten years now. And it's a great organization. I, I actually, in my capacity, I, I interact with 14 different outdoor writers guilds. Um, but Glow was actually one of the first ones that I interacted with. Hmm. And, um, you know, the thing that's kind of cool about a Glow, we started a, about eight years ago, a, a Toyota Let's Go Places scholarship program where we bring young people, new people into some of these, these guilds to introduce them not only to, to outdoor media, but to maybe the outdoor world as a, as a, uh, a profession. And uh, so a GLOW is kind of the pilot program, and here we are almost nine years later, and we've given out more than 90 scholarships around the country wow. to young media people, to influencers. And some of them have really forged their own path, um, and uh, you know, we'd like to take a little bit of credit for them. But uh, these organizations are doing a great job of, of finding these young people and, and bringing them into the fold. Yeah, it's important. You know, it, it, that's something else that people talk about is we need to get young people involved in the outdoors and things like that. And this is another way to, to, to not just say it, but to, but to do it. And uh, and I've seen I think that's how I met you the first time was after you gave out one of those scholarships at uh, at the uh, the Aglo uh, conference out there. Um, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. The uh, again, uh, the lion's share of these young people who receive these scholarships go on to bigger and better things. And Again, all they need is a toe in the industry. And the beauty of these organizations is that all of a sudden you've got a whole room full of mentors willing to talk about uh, about their time in the outdoors. But the one thing that's kind of neat, Brett, is that when I started this, this scholarship, I, I thought it was just gonna be a one-way mentorship. It ended up being a 360 because a lot of these young people came in with all their social media savvy and they and they get with the, the, the veteran reporters and show them how to amplify their stories and amplify their own work online uh, or through YouTube, through social media channels. And so, again, it's been a beautiful marriage of generations and, again, all circulating around the outdoors. Yeah, and this is a good time to mention the outdoor feed, by the way, too, probably a new way to, to see what's coming out of. The outdoor feed is kind of neat because it shows everything that, I mean, a Glow is a pretty big, pretty big organization with a lot of people that are creating outdoor related content just, you know, every day. And not just the media people, but our corporate partnerships and our, our tourism partnerships, our destinations and everybody. Like, it's just a great way to, to, to kind of see. Oh, look at that. There's a picture of Dan on there, too. Look at that. Uh, it's just a great way to, to get some great outdoor content and learn about what's new, what's coming out. Like that that story about uh, European, go back up a little bit there, Dan. The European hunting traditions, that was just kind of a wild article, just about how, how hunting is around the world. You know, we have our own traditions here in America. And, you know, there's a lot of similar traditions, obviously, in this country. But when you, you start learning about things over in Europe and other parts of the world and just there's obviously a lot of similarities, but definitely some differences on how people grew up in the outdoor world and other parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's universal. I think one of the silver linings that came out of COVID was that it introduced young people to the outdoors. Uh, kind of got them out of the household. I my my middle son did a, a summer internship with Dunham's, and where mm. he worked in a couple of stores, and they could not keep canoes or kayaks in stock. Yeah. They would get forty or fifty at a time, and they'd fly out the doors. And again, it was by people his age. 
So again, um, if there's anything that came of it, I think uh, Gen Y and Gen Z now have a greater appreciation of the outdoors and hopefully they can keep that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there were, you know, not a lot of positives about the pandemic, but I think that was a big one. A lot of people got introduced to doing things in the out world, in the outdoor world. As long as you didn't, uh, as long as you don't have a, an uh, an outboard motor in Michigan, that I won't go. Well, yeah. I won't. I won't get into politics. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there were some I, weird. I, I, know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. There were some weird things that happened. Absolutely. Um, but but just going back to Toyota for a minute, why is it important for Toyota as a brand? Uh, to be involved in the outdoors? Well, I mean, we'd like to be involved in every segment of society. And again, there is such an appreciation for the outdoors here in the United States, thanks to people like Teddy Roosevelt, um, that you know we want to be involved in that. And again, it all kind of boils back down to being, not only being part of the, of the fabric of the, of the communities you serve in like we do, we've got 13 factories here in the United States and close to 37,000 direct employees. But again, it's, it kind of boils back down to societal good. And again, you can't get any more societal impactful than you can you know, doing things for the outdoors. And so that's why we have such long standing programs like National Public Lands Day um, that we can get involved with. And, and again, it's not so much about wearing, wearing the Toyota team wear and saying how great we are, but it's actually getting out there and, and, and helping those communities do things, be it cleaning up a ditch or, you know, dredging a, dredging a river. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's all about doing our part. And again, I kind of get back to it. You, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta walk the walk. If you're, if you're claiming to be environmentally conscious, you just can't say, okay, here's a new logo. Aren't we great? No, it's, you gotta get out there and you gotta do it and you gotta prove it. How, you know, going back to the pandemic, too, for just a minute, there was obviously some supply chain issues and vehicles and uh, vehicle manufacturers were obviously hit pretty hard with that situation. How are things coming along now? Well, our, our execs are in our um, folks who are looking at the crystal ball are saying we're probably still about another year out from getting back to pre-pandemic levels. And again, people kind of focus in on the microchip, but there's yeah. also other other componentry that's in, in play as well. So um, we're doing a good job of, of fulfilling the um, the uh, the purchases and, and 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 the orders. So literally every vehicle that you, you order, you can get within three or four months period of time. It's just that that overlapping inventory, those extra vehicles that sit on the car lots, those are where you're seeing the depletion. You just you know you'd, you'd crank up some vehicles and they would be parceled out to our 1,300 dealers around the country, and you know, to hopefully sell well those inventories last maybe two or three days at best. So we're taking care of the orders first and foremost. I just wish we had extra products sitting around. I, I know our, our competitors feel the same way. Oh yeah, for sure. I think it hit everybody equally. Well, what else, anything else uh, on the horizon for Toyota that you want to share with us? Uh, well, we've got a lot going on. We have a lot of new product coming out in the, in the next year, actually in, in, in LA this week, there's the LA auto show. And actually, we are uh, showing our brand new Prius. So mm. it, may, it may be not a vehicle that speaks to the outdoor community so much. But uh, again, it's the it's the grandfather. It's the patriarch of the hybrid movement from 25 years ago. So um, you'll probably be seeing some news um, in the next day or so about uh, this new stylized Prius coming out of L.A. I'll tell you what. I know a couple of guys that are in, you know, that do hunt and fish and they've got one. And we might poke a little bit of fun at them now and again, uh, but they, they say, yeah, I'll, I'll let's see who spends more money on fuel, <laughs> you know, and they, they travel all over the place. So yep. um, yeah, you know, it's hard, it's hard to argue with that. Right. And, and again, that's the whole, the beauty of the hybrid movement right now, again, about 25% of all the, not only the, the, the trucks we sell, but all the vehicles we sell across our line, if they're all pretty much hybridized now um, again, I, I drive a, a RAV4 hybrid and it gets me 42 miles per gallon. So, yeah. uh, I mean, that means I'm filling up maybe every third week. So especially if gas prices stay the way they are, people are going to be looking at uh, getting a little bit greener and, and, and hybrids are the way to go right now. All right. So uh, we talked a lot about the hunting and, and outdoor the camping uh, side of things for Toyota. Do you guys do, do much on the fishing side? Well, we do quite a bit, again, is, like I mentioned, Bassmasters on the professional circuit. But a couple of years ago, I was introduced to uh, the, the, the gang down at the University of Montevallo in Alabama. 
a couple of their students had won a couple of our Toyota to Let's Go Places scholarships. And and I talked to their director, who was a gentleman by the name of William Crawford, who's also their their uh, head fishing coach, their their top angling coach. And I said, hey, listen, I'd, I'd like to support your, your program because you guys are doing fantastic things, not only in this program, but also in the fishing scene. And he explained to me that in the scholar program, uh, outdoor scholar program, they have 105 students enrolled. 70 of them are members of the bass fishing team. And wow. they come from 18 different states. Now, I kind of came on the, the, back, the back end of it. They just won their first national championship. And so I said, hey, I... I, I, I'd love to glom onto a winner. <laughs> not only do I believe, not only do, not only do I, uh, do, not only do I believe in your program, but I believe in your team. And so I said, here, um, here's a little bit of money. Put the title logo on a couple of boats. Put it on the jersey, uh, and let me do what I can to support your your team. Actually, they even came up to uh, Saginaw Bay here during the summer, and I got a chance to to, to drive up and um, and and meet a lot of the, the young folks, and they're fantastic. Not only did they do well, they that weekend for fishing, but they're just fine young people. And lo and behold, they won their second consecutive national championship. And uh, in fact, I'm brandishing their, uh, oh, look their at ring. That. Oh. Um, so as a sponsor, they gave me the opportunity to, uh, to purchase a national championship ring. So uh, I didn't do anything other than to write a check and, 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 and give them a lot of attaboys and attaboys girls, but uh, it's a great program. And again, it's, uh, I, I, it's, it's the first of its kind in the country. And I think there's going to be a lot of schools, kind of, especially in the South, look at this and say, you can actually go to school and learn more about the outdoors and get a degree. That's great. And, uh, maybe it doesn't all lead towards, you know, being a professional angler. But they said, you know, they've got uh, some of their graduates have joined companies like Hummingbird and uh, Minocopa and Pradco and Buckmasters and Sub7. So um, they have people that are moving on to bigger and better things in the outdoors. So. You know, the least that I could do is support a great program like that. So did they get scholarships based on academics or their ability to, to skip under docs? Uh, I, I think it's a little bit of both, maybe. But, <laughs> um, they, I mean, they're, they're ad- academically driven first, first and foremost. But, I mean, this national championship that they won is no joke. They beat out 200 other schools, and a lot of them are big-name schools uh, with a lot bigger, you know, a lot bigger populaces than Montebello. So, um, but again, that just shows the power of, of, of bass fishing right now, the collegiate ranks. Um, I mean, they are a club sport, but there's also some schools out there that are flirting with the idea of making it a varsity sport. Um, but uh, again, it's, it just shows how fishing is, is exploded amongst young people and, and Montevallo is leading the way. Well, that's another, again, another, another way to solve the, the problem of getting youth interested in the outdoors is making them part of, part of school programs uh, from the, the clay target leagues with the kids to uh, high school fishing teams to collegiate fishing teams, you know, uh, NASP, natural, national archery in the schools. Yep. I mean, that's, yep. that's just another way, you know, get them yep. started and, and make it, you know, I don't want to say force them into it, but, but make it a, an option instead of play, just playing football and baseball or whatever give them the chance to go out there and shoot trap or skeet or something like that. I think that's great. Yeah. It's, uh, I, again, I, there's a lot of schools involved in, in this and, uh, yeah, I, it's, it's exciting. In fact, I, I, I mentioned this, I, I'm not dropping names, but I am dropping names. So I, I saw Kevin Van Dam a couple of months ago at one of our events and I talked about collegiate bass fishing. He goes, yeah, man, it's, I wish I had this back in my day. Cause Kevin's right. like my age. And I said, yeah, I said, I we're sponsoring a team of Montevallo goes, those kids know how to fish down there. So, hmm. so, so KVD knows about the kids at Montevallo, you know, and uh, the kids that up at Adrian, Michigan and the other schools that are really good. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, I think the future of bass fishing is, 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 is strong because uh, the colleges are helping prolong or at least maybe uh, produce the next KVD. Who knows? Man, I say that all the time. I wish they would have had the clay target league when I was in school and mm-hmm. and uh, fishing teams. You know, I played some sports and, and did whatever. And, and obviously not playing any of them anymore, but right. a clay target team or a fishing team or something like that. That's not only are you, are you participating in a high school sport and an after school activity, but you're it's something that's probably going to stick with you for your entire life. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, people retire to fish, right? But right. wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great to do that for a living and then just right. keep doing it and doing it and doing it? And it's, it's, um, it's, it's a beautiful thing. But I wanted to make sure I gave a little bit of props to the, to the students down at Montevallo University. They're, 
not only doing doing it in the classroom, but they're doing it on the ponds and the lakes. Absolutely. Well, we're looking forward to the trail hunter, uh, the trail hunter options next year. Um, you know, if anything new comes out with that, make sure to let us know. I, I'm looking forward to seeing one. I think they look like uh, I think they look like a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie. Yep. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I'll make sure to bring those to a couple of my outdoor conferences, including a glow. There you go. Perfect. I think we should plan. Let's plan on a glow trip, a camping trip. And then we all just camp in one of those. I think that'd there be is. I think that'd be a great idea. That'd be fun. All right. Uh, Toyota, what's the website? Toyota newsroom.com. Toyota newsroom.com. All right. Kurt McAllister, uh, appreciate the time today. Good luck with everything there at Toyota. And, and um, are you, a, are you a Lions fan? I am. Man. I am. Well, if you can, if you can, if you can do that and admit to it, you can do anything. So I, I have a, I, I have a belief that there's a special place in heaven for Lions fans. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, hey, the Cubs waited over 100 years for a World Series. Hopefully we don't have to wait 100 years for a Super Bowl. We, we would just like to see a Super Bowl or sniff a Super Bowl. I mean, one, one playoff victory in the Super Bowl era, think about that. One playoff victory in 56 years is pretty pathetic. Well, we, so, don't, have, uh, we don't have any as Viking fans. We've been we've been to four of them, but we don't have any yeah. victories. And uh, but but I'll tell you what that game against the Bills felt like a Super well, Bowl victory. That was that was a heck of a game. I uh, everything that when they when they fumbled on the uh, when they fumbled on the goal their own goal, their own goal line to to cough it up and allow overtime. That was that was crazy. Yeah, unreal. Yeah, that was great. I think yeah, it took a if, few. It, yeah, let's say it. there's. If there's a better receiver in in the league than Jefferson, you got you got to prove it to me. I'll, I'll the, tell you, I've been. I mean, dynamite. he's so good, and I've I've just been a little bit worried about him. And you know, like Stephon Diggs was a good wide receiver. I didn't really like his attitude very much, to be honest. And I was worried that Jefferson might go down that way. But holy smokes, what he did, what he did in that football game, and uh, I, he's got to be one of the best receivers in the league. Yeah, and and the catch he came up with that'll be the catch of the year. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, Kurt, National uh, national Manager of Outdoor Communication with Toyota, Kurt McAllister. Uh, thanks for the time today on the show. You bet. Skull. <laughs> there you go. 852 million acres of public land. 147 million private properties. All in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. Come ice fish the famous waters of Minnesota's Lake of the Woods, the walleye capital of the world. Experience full-service resorts featuring heated fish houses, ice transportation, meal plans, and sleeper house options. From the Northwest Angle to the South Shore, Rainy River, and Baudette, the Midwest's number one ice fishing destination. Walleye, Sauger, Perch, and Northern Pike, Minnesota's Lake of the Woods, best fishing anywhere. For more information, log on to lakeofthewoodsmn.com. This is Sporting Journal Radio. I'm Brett Amundsen. Thank you for tuning in on this station right here by downloading the podcast, or maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Thank you very much, along with Dan Amundsen over there. And it's time to head up to Lake of the Woods to check in with Joe Henry from Lake of the Woods Tourism. Joe, how you doing? Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing well. We were watching a Jason Mitchell show on YouTube the other day, and he was up at Lake of the Woods. And I happened to notice hanging from his his mirror there was a Keep a Clean logo. So... Uh, it's about time to start thinking about ice fishing and, and cleaning up after yourself, isn't it? Yeah, you know what? It sure is. And kudos to Jason Mitchell for hanging that logo. Jason's a good guy and uh, um, hell of a fisherman. But, you know, um, I'll tell you something. You know, that keep it clean thing, you know, if, if people haven't heard of it, you know, uh, about 10 years ago up at Lake of the Woods, the friends of Zippo Bay State Park were doing their, their annual spring cleanup on the beach, the nice sandy beaches of Zippo Bay, uh, Zippo Bay Park, State Park. And... You know, it just so happened that the wind was blown in just perfectly and et cetera, et cetera. You know, they got like four trailer loads full of trash from ice okay. fishing. It was everything from wood to bobbers to plastic to, you, you know, who knows what else. Now, that, that's the stuff that floated. Imagine what didn't float and sunk to the bottom of the lake. That's because the wind was just right. And that's in one small part of Lake of the Woods. Now, with that being said... 
you know, we talked about it and said, geez, with all that going on, with two and a half million angling hours on our ice each winter, how much garbage is out there? So we, we pulled together a group of stakeholders and created a group called Keep It Clean. And the purpose of Keep It Clean is to educate, promote, and enforce keeping Lake of the Woods clean. So fast forward 10 years later, we've had sales promotion items. We'd, we've had you know different uh, geofencing activities going on the lake where if you cross through an invisible, invisible barrier, we'll give you a nice reminder to keep Lake of the Woods clean. Oh, I thought you, you, you were going to say, I thought you were going to say you get a little shock in your neck if you go across the invisible, put up some that's invisible. If leave, that's if you leave any garbage behind. <laughs> It's, it's, invisible a, it's a good fence. job. It's not a light <laughs> one. But, no. So that's, uh, we, we, we do some geofencing. We do signage. We do dri- uh, uh, coasters for some of the, the um, bars at the resorts that say keep it clean and, and the table tents, things like that. You get it. And, you know, fast forward 10 years later, we've had some other areas show interest because this is an ice belt issue. This isn't just a Lake of the Woods issue. Everywhere there's there's ice anglers and, and, and snowmobiling on the ice and, and any kind of winter activities, there's going to, unfortunately, with a human element, there's going to be some, you know, uh, garbage and, and human waste and things like that, unfortunately, go along with it. So um, since then, we've had, uh, you know, a Red Lake, Upper and Lower Red Lake, as well as Lake Mille Lacs join us. And we got many other areas asking to join us. So we created this Keep It Clean thing. We came up with, instead of a Lake of the Woods Keep It Clean logo, we now have a uh, just a generic keep it clean logo and these other areas are starting to jump on board we have other areas that are, are inquiring about it and what we're going to be doing is we're going to let other area lakes and, and lake associations and and different things that have a lot of ice activity we're going to allow them to join our group for just basically uh, signing an agreement saying that uh you know they'll they'll use our logo they won't alter our logo they're not going to alter our messaging we've got to keep some kind of control but there's no cost to it Heck, we already have a lot of the messaging done. We have a generic logo done, and uh, we have meetings on a periodic basis. And I think that, uh, um, you know, by all of us working together, by the way, we're working closely with the Minnesota DNR. We have a communication with those guys, with our legislators. Uh, we've been communicated with MinFish, which is a very, very strong fishing organization in Minnesota. So we, we got a lot of, a lot of uh, momentum going, and we need to keep this momentum. You know, Brad, I think it's, you get two kinds of people, my opinion. Number one, you get a very small percentage of people that just don't care. And then you have a, another percentage of people that are very good meaning people. But, you know, when you go out and, and say sleep on the ice for a few nights between, you know, you set a couple garbage bags outside, you set a few things outside that you, you fully intend to, to clean up afterwards. Maybe you throw some stuff in the back of your pickup. The, the problem is, is that after three days between wind, snow, 25 below, you leave in a hurry, um, things happen. And even if you leave just a little bit of garbage behind, you multiply that by all the people that fish our lakes, it, it ends up being significant by the end of the year. So we're, we're really working on this and, and really trying to remind people, hey, man, take that extra effort, plan ahead, do what it takes to, to keep our, our, our ice clean. Well, especially when you start talking about what the EPA or somebody was going to start getting involved at some point, right? If we keep putting stuff in the lakes, I mean, fishermen are going to are going to cause themselves some more headaches if if they keep leaving garbage on the ice. It's just the just the reality of the situation. Think about this one: if you and I and Danny were out fishing in a boat, and I we had some garbage, you know, with cans and maybe maybe sandwich wrappers, whatever, maybe a bait container, and we take that, and we put that in a garbage bag. And I tie a rope onto it and throw it over the side of the boat and drag it around in the water. You think I'm absolutely nuts. Yet it's nothing for ice anglers to put garbage on the ice, fully intending to pick it all up. Yeah. But you know how that goes. Yeah, for sure. Well, keep it clean. I think it's a great idea. Um, and any way we can help push that message to keep our legs clean, uh, let me know. We should talk fishing a little bit too, Joe. How How is the ice situation coming on Lake of the Woods? So, um if I may just stop for a second and, and, and mention that we are very appreciative of, uh, you know, Min Fish and specifically Ron Chera. You know, they uh, they did a real nice video for uh, for Keep It Clean. And uh, that Keep It Clean video is going to actually be playing at the uh, St. Paul Ice Fishing Show that's coming up here in uh, in early December. And uh, so kudos to those guys for uh, for helping to spread the Keep It Clean message as well. Absolutely. Are you going to be down there with the booth? Yeah. Yep. So Lake of the Woods Tours and we'll have a booth again. Um, you know, right when you walk in, uh, right when you walk in, you go down the escalators and right when you walk in there in the right hand side, we got a booth right towards the end there. And uh, 
Uh, I'll tell you what, it's going to be great. We're going to be giving away a, a, a fishing trip up to Lake of the Woods. We're going to be uh, giving away our visitor guides. And uh, I'll be there, of course, the whole time talking ice fishing with folks. You know, a lot of times, Brett, people have questions. You know, hey, I've, I've gone up to Lake of the Woods before. You know, I always use my own stuff. I want to use a resort with my, uh, you know, grandsons this year. Or we've gone to this resort. We're thinking about going to another part of the lake. Hey, what's the current uh, uh, rules about going up to the Northwest Angle? Hey, who should we go to over here? A million questions. How do we do it if we want to cook fish in our sleeper fish house? I mean, all these questions. And uh, we're going to be answering them all. We're going to be helping people as much as we can. Do they ask you what lures to bring? Oh, they ask all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I should mention, too, you know, we, we talked about keep it clean. Uh, Tom's Tackle, which is a local tackle company up at Lake of the Woods, they have created for us a, a keep it clean stop sign jig and spoon. Now, this Keep It Clean stop sign jig and spoon, and Danny, it's right on their website under uh, Ice Fish and Tackle, but, you know, it's a, uh, it's a glow-in-the-dark spoon, so it'll work well for, you know, our stained water lakes like Lake of the Woods, uh, Red Lake, things like that. But, you know, when you talk about the clear water lakes like a Mille Lacs and such, it's that glow-in-the-dark spoon, but we've got the Keep It Clean logo on it. So you got the greens and the blues, which will represent, you know, more of the perch colors. And, of course, at night, there's a lot of night fishing goes on in Mille Lacs. That glow-in-the-dark will be good. So yeah, we think that the spoon is going to be a very good spoon to use. It's kind of cool. I think the spoon is like five ninety nine, dollars but it's a good lure. And uh, you know what? 20% of the proceeds of, of, of that lure are going to go towards the Keep It Clean program. Oh, so really? we're kind of excited about it. I can't wait to catch a nice walleye on that and have that big that, that Keep It Clean spoon hanging out of that walleye's mouth. Where I mean, where are you going to go to catch walleyes, Joe? I mean, yeah. Well, I'll tell you something: uh, the walleye capital of the world that has an estimated <laughs> ten million of them uh, probably isn't a bad start. Uh, that's great. Well, I know uh, people get excited about early ice. Obviously, there's safety to be considered, so we don't want to tell people to go out on on ice uh, that's not ready yet. But man, we got to be building ice in northern Minnesota right now. Yeah, we sure are. And you know, the back bays. You know, I saw that uh, one of our one of our resorts posted. They just walked out, and there you go, Zipple Bay. But they walked out in front and just took a sample, and it was already three inches thick last week. So I'll tell you what, uh, it's coming. And here, I say this every year, but it's worth mentioning. You know, when you go on a lake, whether it's Lake of the Woods or any lake, you know, you might go out of one area, and the ice conditions are are one thing, but you can go just a little ways down the shoreline. And the ice conditions can be totally different. That it happens because of springs, because of the way the snow blows in and, and you know, uh, creates drifts and things. It happens because, you know, m- maybe when there was forming ice, a whole bunch of wind came in and, and in one area of the lake knocked those sheets around so there's pockets of open water. Who knows why? There's different currents that set up. The bottom line is this. When you go on Lake of the Woods, I'll be specific, when you go out on that, uh, that ice, Make sure that you're working through a resort or outfitter and, and using their marked trail. Their trail is marked for a reason. It's because that's the safest ice. Don't go busting off the trail thinking you're going to get to some uh, some walleye bounty that's not marked because it's way off the trail. Stay on the trail, and then when you get out to the fishing grounds where most of the fishing's going on, you're going to know. They're going to let you know where you can go off the trail and thing. But I really encourage people to to stay on those marked trails for safety. It's it's that important. I do it. Uh, I know the the other anglers that uh, that go out and fish Lake of the Woods that are are, are fishing lots of they, they they follow the marked trails and then they they branch out to their fishing spots if the, the outfitters and guides say that it's safe ice, you know, uh, uh, to the sides. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if people want to find out what resorts up there they can learn more from or visit websites to or plan a trip or learn more about keep it clean, what should they do, Joe? You know, we, we have it all on our website, Brett, and that is lakeofthewoodsmn.com. Sporting Journal Radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com.